Good morning, GGCC family. It is wonderful to fellowship together. We're thankful the weather is great outside, but it is time for us to start our service. In the beginning, just want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Uh, we love you. We're thankful to God for you. Thankful for your devotion to God, for your commitment to your families. Thankful for your sacrifice, your prayer, and your loves. And may the Lord bless you and what you do being a mother. Before uh, we look over some announcements, I also wanted to provide um, an update of where we are in the building process. I know a lot of people have come up and are asking questions, and I'm great that there's interest, enthusiasm, and that is wonderful. So uh, just a couple things of things that have been happening behind the scenes and where we're at. Uh, the first point is we have submitted a master plan to the county, so we are just waiting on an update and approval from that. Once we have the master site plan approved, then we can actually go ahead and uh, get a VDOT entrance permit and start actually doing the entrance and doing the driveway. So that would be uh, the next process on the site plan. Uh, but we're also uh, working with the architect and he's working hard to start finalizing the drawings that we have, the building plan, uh, the building itself. And um, once he has those, those then would be actually submitted to our bank for an appraisal, which also takes a little bit of time. Um, and then after that process, we'll be able to see and, and talk about getting a construction loan. And, and also thirdly, where um, after meeting with elders and deacons, we also did want to see what the giving would be for the first quarter of this year. Uh, we were really encouraged by that giving. We're thankful and praise the Lord uh, for the sacrifices that you all do and, and, and giving and honoring the Lord in that regard. Um, and it was just a matter of just trying to see and understand where we are financially, what the impact of getting a construction loan would be on our budget. Uh, although the way construction loans is, uh, the way they work, is you're only paying interest on the amount that is drawn. So you want to be paying interest on the whole amount only as the construction phases are happening. That is the interest you're paying. But again, we still wanted to see what the impact would look like even when we did eventually take out the whole amount for the construction loan. So um, again, that was uh, what we wanted to see with elders and deacons. And we'll actually be having a meeting uh, about that uh, this upcoming week to finalize those details. So again, that's where we are in the, in the process. Uh, it is moving along, it is moving forward, and again, continue praying about it. Lord gives wisdom to the building committee, to the elders, deacons, as, as we're looking to see what the next steps and, and continuing that process would be. Um, now, as you open your bulletins, uh, some of the announcements on the inside, um, we are planning a Memorial Day picnic for the whole church. Um, everyone would be invited, everyone is invited, it would, it would start at, at 3 p.m., and then uh, the church will probably provide a, either hot dogs and um, hamburgers, and then there'll be uh, more information for like a, a, a potluck sign-up so that each of you could bring a side, and so that's organized in that regard. But we'll have those details as, as we get them. Um, again, those interested in water baptism or becoming members, uh, please see Pastor Dmitri or any of the elders that if you have that interest, uh, go ahead and let us know. We'd, we'd like to talk to you and uh, get, you, get you information of what the, that process would look like. Okay. I believe that's kind of all the announcements. And you can see some of the other announcements and the other ministries that we have the, when they meet, the times. Um, so that is ongoing in that regard. With that, I invite you all to stand as we'll be reading from God's Word. And we are reading from Psalm 101. And I actually invite all of us for the first verse. Let's read it together. So Psalm 101, 
The first verse we'll read together, and then I'll continue. Let's read. I will sing of loving kindness and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a great honor and privilege to call upon your name. You are the holy, righteous God. You have set your standard of holiness in your word, dear Lord. And we read of what that is the perfection that is expected. We all fall short of that, dear Lord. None of us can say that I, by myself, am holy with my deeds or words or thoughts. No, we are all guilty before you. But it is by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed to pay the penalty for our sin so that we would be right before you. And we thank you for that. We praise your name, the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we continue to bless your name through songs and as we worship and we think about your holiness and greatness. May our, may our hearts bow and worship before you as we proclaim all of your blessings and all of your goodness, dear Lord. And as we hear the preaching of your word, may it penetrate our heart. May it humble us. May we accept it with joy and gratitude for your revealed word. And we're thankful for all of this, and it is in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. Exalted is our soul, our anthem through eternity. Praises rise and wake the dawn, heralding his majesty. Christ without a rival reigns over all creation.
Christ exalted is our song. The man of sorrows walked and tried, bore the judgment for our wrongs, for our sins was crucified. Hear the love in his refrain, Father, please forgive.
Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 58. Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it upon the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore... Every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in the synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mir miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And I asked the ushers to come to the for to come forward as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us a new life, for calling us to yourself for opening up to us the beauty of the gospel. And we can identify with this man who has found this great treasure. And we do count Jesus as precious. He is the most precious thing for us. And yet we acknowledge that sometimes we live as though there are more, th more precious things than Jesus. And we confess and we ask for forgiveness. Forgive us for the times when we cling to self, promotions, glory, respect, honor. Instead of seeking to glorify you, forgive us, Lord, for choosing the pleasures of sin instead of choosing 
the pleasure of being obedient to you, obeying you. Father, we acknowledge that all of us are unworthy. And if it wasn't for Christ Jesus, none of us could stay, stand here and ask you for mercy and grace. But we come to the throne of grace boldly because of what you, Lord Jesus, had performed on the cross. And Lord, we do ask that you would cause us to be even more devoted, more dedicated with our lives to you. That we would indeed sacrifice everything in our life for the sake of you. May we be a good example of our own households, that our children would see that there is nothing more precious than you. It would be an example to them and they would have their eyes opened by you, Lord. Please work in our children's hearts. Forgive us when, when we ourselves as parents are stumbling blocks to them. Give us wisdom, give us humility, give us love. Allow us to be more obedient to you. Draw us to conformity to your word. We ask that your name would be glorified in us and in our families. We ask that our church would be an effective witness to this great treasure. That the people around us would see the glory of the gospel, that they would be drawn to Christ. Use us, Lord. We acknowledge we can't do anything on our own. No programs, no methods, no techniques, nothing of our own wisdom can accomplish what you can do with your spirit. And so we ask that you would do so. Oh, Lord, we also pray for our country. We pray that you would bless the leadership to, you would pray that you would bless the local government and that you would allow us to continue to meet in peace and, and worship you without any hindrances. We pray for peace around the world. Those who are suffering because of wars or persecution, oh Lord, I pray that you would protect your church, your people. And that you would draw more people to yourself, even through the various conflicts that are going on. Father, we thank you for all your provisions for us. You have provided us with this place that we could meet. And now you have also provided us with a property that we look forward to building on. We ask that you would continue to bless this church and that we would be able to have our own building Thank you for the generosity of, of your people. And we pray that you would give wisdom to the elders as they decide and, and manage the funds that you have provided. Father, I do pray that you would be glorified through the giving of your people. And also, Lord, we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word as Brother Alexander, as he comes and ministers your word. Thank you that your word is alive and active and is sharper than any two-edged sword. May we be edified and instructed in it, and through it, may you receive all the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior before the
Morning again, church. Uh, today we have a very special privilege. We have a guest speaker from Samara, Russia, named Alexander Gurtaev. I'd like to share a little bit about how I know him, how I'm connected with him. 
So, well, first time I met him was 10 years ago. It was actually when the Zota family invited me to go to a, a conference in Vancouver, Washington, when uh, in 2013, when I went there, and it was at the very beginning of even my ministry journey. And so I went there, and I saw Brother Alex Gurtaev as a guest speaker at this conference, and I was amazed. I was thinking, wow, this young person is ex exegeting and expositing God's Word so faithfully, and I was very edified. So that was the first time I met him. And then I got into seminary in 2013, and even that same year on, in fall, um, the seminary needed a guy who would go to Russia to accompany um, Paul Benware, a, a theologian who was teaching about the end times, and, and they made a call, hey, we need someone to volunteer. And I thought, I'll go. I'll go. I didn't you know, realize that you know, this was where Alex is from, so I went there, and, and I was met by Alex, and you know, I was told that he is the dean, or he was in charge of this school that's, that Samara has that trains men to be pastors all around Russia and the, and the Slavic countries. So they're training men there, and he's in charge, one of the people who's overseeing the whole school. And then in 2000, and, well, I'll say 16, had another opportunity to go again to Samara. And so I met up again with Alex, and we, we, I was even invited to their room, the, the elders' room where they were praying. And so it was, it was there that I got to know Alex a little bit. And then this past Shepherds Conference that some of us men went there, we met up again with Alex and talked, and he said he was finishing up his dissertation, his doctorate degree here at the TMS, and uh, he'll be graduating in May. He'll be coming back and got to talking, and he's, I asked him if he would be willing to come to minister to us, and he said he would. And so we talked it over and we talked with our elders and decided we're going to invite him, and he agreed to it. And so, long story short, here he is. Let me tell you a little bit about Alex. So he has been married for 18 years. He has seven children, uh, ranging from 17 to four. Seven children from 17 to four, so a large family. He has been a pastor of the Church of Transfiguration for 10 years. And then two years ago, he joined a church plant so for the last two years, he's been co-shepherding a church plant called Christ Love Church. Christ Love Church. He continues to be in administration of the Samara Center of Biblical Studies. He's a director there. He's also a teacher, a full-time teacher of Greek and all the New Testament classes, including hermeneutics as well. He has many accomplishments in his life, um, medical and theological. And so it is a great privilege to hear God's word from Alex. Thank you, Dimitri, for such a warm introduction. Uh, dear friends, I'm pretty sure that uh, you know how serious is the problem caused by pseudo-believers. Such people create a chaos among Christians. They produce confusion and mess. They actually mess up everything in the church. So, wheat and weeds are waiting for Jesus' second coming to settle the issue, who is who. In order to consider this problem, I invite you to open Titus 2 with me, and we'll read verses from 11 to 14. Okay, let's read together. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people, for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Despite this clear teaching of Scripture, 
both Christ and Christians were always surrounded by those who only pretend to be his followers. Consider this. During Jesus' earthly ministry, there were such deceivers. Or sometimes, we would say, self-deceived people. The Lord warned them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Yet, such people refuse to listen to him, and thus many of those who identify themselves with his disciples abandoned him and stopped following him. You know that church history is also filled with numerous sad stories about so-called followers of Christ who did not represent him well. For example, if you look back at the condition of a Christian church in Germany during the Third Reich, you'll be terrified, literally terrified. Let me draw your attention to uh, some really terrifying statements quoted by Erwin Lutzer in his book called Hitler's Cross. One of the leaders of German church, Pastor Julius Lloyd Herzer, proclaimed, Christ has come to us through Hitler. Through his honesty, his faith, and his idealism, the Redeemer found us. We know today the Savior has come. We have only one task. Be German, not Christian. The official manifest of the National Church of Reich included the following statement. The National Church declares that to it, and therefore to the German nation, it has been decided that the Führer's Mein Kampf is the greatest of all documents. It not only contains the greatest, but it embodies the purest and truest ethics for the present and future life of our nation. I hope that you find these statements not only awkward, but also sobering. Think about them. It is right to evaluate such distortions of Christian confession and past. However, it is way more helpful to be ready to discern the same danger in our present. Unfortunately, weeds are still a part of visible church. And they will hurt believers. They will cause confusion in congregations. They will drive unbelievers away from Christ. Dear friends, we must acknowledge that this dissonance between one's confession and actual life still bothers us. We face this problem quite regularly. It attacks true believers from the very first days of Christianity. Just heed to James and Paul as they expose hypocrisy of pseudo-Christianity. There are always some people who insist only on verbal confession of faith. They emphasize some kind of religious knowledge. However, James calls their faith dead because they don't pursue holy life. There are also others who reject the firm gospel foundation and insist on some kind of godly, moral life. They end up with moralism and legalism that Paul rebukes in his epistles. Dear friends, the passage that we read returns us to the biblical alternative, stating, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us. Listen, the grace of God both saves us and instructs us. And please don't forget that the Apostle Paul wrote these words to Cretan believers who had to deal with false teachers. And lifestyle of those liars was in conflict with their confession. 
as Paul describes them at the end of chapter 1, verse uh, 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Thus, at the beginning of chapter 2, Paul instructs Titus to pay attention to the sound teaching. That excludes such conflict. He writes in verse 1, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Verses 2 to 10. Describe godly love, uh, life expected from the various groups of believers. Titus must address both old and young, both men and women, as well as slaves. Thus, all people, all people, he must teach them to walk according to the gospel. Indeed, godly life reveals the power of the gospel. For this reason, Paul repeats this thought again and again. In verse 5, he writes, so that the word of God will be not dishonored. In verse 8, he expands this idea, clarifying, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. In verse 10, he brings this thought to its climax, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. Dear friends, these uh, instructions addressed to all men are followed by the reminder of the gospel in verses 11 to 14, which we read. Now, the gospel is the sure foundation of godly life. And this is not the end of Paul's instruction, exhortation. At the beginning of chapter 3, he summarizes his teaching, bringing all men together under authority of the word. He insists, remind them, verse 1, remind them that saving grace of the gospel, verse 4, leads to sensible, righteous, and godly life, verse 8. So let us ask again, what does Paul's reminder of the grace of God teach us? As we read, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us. These words help us to understand that godly life is one of the best evidence of the power of the gospel. Indeed, our godly life exposes the saving purpose of God. It proves, proves the effectiveness of Christ's saving work. God's grace brings salvation to all. All men. And you can't deny this fact because transformed life of many people witness for it. So what does grace instruct us to do or not to do? In our text, we see the radical transformation of believers' lives, um, which affects their past, present, and future. Let us emphasize three lessons Three lessons given by Paul in this passage. They are very simple. First, don't look back. Second, don't live like others live. And third, don't stare at your feet. Okay, easy to remember. So let's begin. First, lesson number one. Don't look back. The first lesson is derived from the uh, first phrase in verse 12. It emphasizes the content of instruction or training that comes from the saving grace. We read, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. In other words, this grace instructs us not to return to our former lifestyle. Our sinful life was abandoned, forgotten by us. You see, the Apostle Paul rejects any compromise. His reminder is quite radical. He insists on total denial of our former behavior. Remember, the false believers deny God by their deeds. So we, so we must deny our former deeds for the sake of Christ and his gospel. 
Although, after washing, pigs return to wallowing into the mire, and dogs return to their own vomit. Genuine children of God must not look back and return to their former lives with their values and habits. So let's check. What do we need to keep our eyes from? And there are two detestable things uh, we have to fight against in our Christian lives. Uh, go back with me to verse 12. Uh, Paul draws our attention to ungodliness and worldly desires. First, we must stay away from any wrong attitude to God that characterized our former living. The apostle emphasized the true believers, the true believers rejected ungodliness at their conversion. Our former lives were characterized by total absence of the fear of the Lord. Worship, reverence before Him. But look now, now the root of ungodliness is cut by God's grace. There is no room for practical atheism in our lives. We just can't live as there is no God over us. Our former lives were pretty much the same as life of the unrighteous judge from Jesus' proverb. It said that he did not fear God and did not respect man. But now, we hate such a worldview that promotes egotism, that vindicates the habits of our old self. So second, we must keep ourselves away from worldly Desires. They express the wrong attitude to our life. They distort both our self-understanding and relationships with others. But look, the Apostle Paul argues that worldly desires are our past, uh, which we have to forget. Have to forget. When we look around, we see clearly that the world is ruled by various dominant, selfish ambitions, sensual desires, love for gaining stuff, more stuff, and more stuff. However, the Bible characterizes this dominance as sinful. They should not control a believer. As Paul writes, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. We just can't return to our former living. All bridges were burned by God's grace. We can't associate ourselves with mockers following after their own ungodly lusts, as Jude notes. Dear friends, the grace of God has started its training process in our lives, and we are still far away from our final destination, still far away from our final goal. And we should not deceive ourselves. We face many tricky temptations to look back, to look back. And if we fail in the midst of these temptations, old selfish, old selfish habits will reestablish their former positions. Our former sins come back when we are relaxed and prefer spiritual nodding instead of alertness. Let's acknowledge Sometimes we are terrified, noticing the expressions of our old self in our reactions and responses. Sometimes we see that we are attacked by our former lusts, lusts which were ours in our ignorance. Sometimes our actions demonstrate total neglect of the fear of the Lord. We act like there is no God who sees and knows everything. Friends, think about it. How many are those who return to their former sins and habits? How many are those f who forget that the gospel is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes? In order to stand firm in the day of temptation, we have to refuse to look back. Also, don't look at the, wind, at the wind and then the waves as Peter did or other circumstances. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. 
fix your eyes upon Jesus, who was delivered over because of our transgressions, who was raised because of our justification. That's one of the clearest evidence of our salvation is renouncing of our former lives, lives that were driven by ungodliness and worldly desires. Our liberation from such a lifestyle demonstrates the saving power of the gospel, of the grace. This freedom reminds us that we have everything that we need. Everything. Everything that we need to walk godly for the sake of Christ and his gospel. So our first lesson from verse 12 is this. Don't look back. Don't look back. Let's add the second lesson. Don't live like others live. Don't live like others live. Now, in the second part of verse 12, the Apostle Paul emphasizes our present state and reminds us that the grace of God instruct us, instructs us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. He describes our transformed life by means of three adverbs, sensibly, righteously, and godly. In so doing, he presents a contrast between the first part of the verse and the second part, between our former lives and present lives. We were ungodly, driven by worldly desires, but now we exchanged lusts for sensible life, worldliness for righteousness, ungodliness for godliness. Do you see a perfect match? Clear contrast between the first part of the verse and the second? Consider this. Paul talks about our life in the present age. And we know. And we know that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It's driven by sin. And sin is advertised by the servants of the evil one. The majority of men are approaching eternal destruction. And they don't even know that there is another way. The way of salvation. As a dead fish, they go with, with the flow. As a dead fish, they will be thrown on the shore. A believer is different. A believer is different. He receives the call. Don't live like others live. The saving grace changes everything. Let's look at the three characteristics of a believer in verse 12. In verse 12, Paul mentions sensibility, righteousness, and godliness. They encompass our attitude to ourselves, to others, and to God. First, the Apostle Paul reminds us that the gospel teaches Christians to live sensibly. That is, to walk wisely. Not to trust in our emotions, but think soberly. To heed wisdom. We know that the world walks according to flesh. It is controlled by its lusts. It's driven by emotions. Yet, believer, believers are called to control their emotions. How? By saturating their minds with the biblical truth. Consider this. We control our emotions by saturating our minds with biblical truth. We know that the world defies its self, its lusts, and yet we walk not according to flesh, but according to the gospel. We are not confirmed to this world, but are transformed by renewing of our mind. This is exactly what Titus was called to teach Cretan believers, according to the first 10 verses of chapter 2. So second, Apostle Paul urges Christians to live Righteously, that is to obey the sound teaching, especially by loving one another. We know that the word, world walks as we expect from the world. Uh, and the world is not ashamed of its lifestyle. Yet Christians are different. They remember that the values that dominate the world must not even be named among them. Because they are called to be holy. We know that the world loves its own. Why? Read. They are from the world. 
Therefore, they speak us from the world, and the world listens to them. Yet believers enjoy different attitude. They are hated by the world because the world loves neither God nor his word. Third, the grace of God instructs us to walk godly. That is, to be guided by the fear of the Lord. To be driven by worshiping the Lord. We know that worldly desires are a result of ungodliness, since man suppresses the truth by unrighteousness. However, believers' righteousness and wisdom are results of their worship, since the fear of the Lord is the instruction for, for wisdom. We know that, that ungodliness makes people blind. So we're not surprised that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Dear friends, do you agree that grace of God is not cheap? It is not. Its value is immeasurable. It's always at work. It constantly instructs us, trains us. It teaches us that our faith is not only a verbal confession of certain truths, but think about it. Unfortunately, real lives of many so-called believers are far away from wisdom, righteousness, and godliness. Let's acknowledge that we all face temptation to follow our emotions. Sometimes we fear man. Sometimes we're proud. We are resentful, bitter. We envious. We love to control others. When unbelievers are addicted to sensual sins, it doesn't surprise us, right? They act according to their nature. They're like sharks. They always go after the blood, always. Yet when believers get involved into the same pursuit, that is surprising. That is surprising. Their Christian lives become dim. It, become, it becomes gloomy. They live like others live. They follow the crowd. However, the essence of our faith is not in words only, not only in confession, right? Faith affects our lives. Just think about it. Is it not a tragedy when some believers are ashamed to confess their faith in the secular society? Why? Why so? They're ashamed because they know that there is no difference. No difference. They act like others act. Dear friends, we call to be children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we appear as lights in the world. You know, some Christians, says, uh, some Christians say that we have to be like this world in order to be heard by the world. Oh, that's a great mistake. It's a grave mistake. The whole point is in the difference between light and the darkness. We know that the light of the gospel shone upon us. We believe that our Savior crushed our old self and created new one through regeneration. So we are willing to accept his instruction. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Thus, the grace of God instructs us. First, don't look back. Second, don't live like others live. These instructions encompass our past and present. But what about our future? What about our future? Let's turn to the third lesson. Don't stare at your feet. Don't stare at your feet. Indeed, we, we just can't live without hope. The Apostle Paul adds immediately to his instruction the following words. Uh, see verses 13 and 14. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people, for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These words help us to lift our eyes to heaven and not to stare at our feet. 
Only hope for Jesus' return makes our life meaningful here and now. Think about it. We know that there is a purpose in everything we endure now. There is a purpose in everything we endure now. The Apostle Peter also emphasized that understanding of our future determines our present life. He argues, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting in the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? In verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Yes, we know that darkness dominates this world now. But for us, the living hope for Christ's return is like the first beam of rising sun that indicates coming, approaching of daylight. As a result, our present life, our present lifestyle depends on Christ Jesus, his first appearance and his second coming. So his comings offer us two reasons, two reasons to walk with joy and not to stare at our feet. The first reason for our godly life, accompanied by joy following after Christ, is the glory of the second coming, the glory of the second coming. Verse 13 reminds us that he is coming, coming back in glory. We read, looking for the blessed hope and the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This hope gives us confidence and true joy. His appearance will bring us true knowledge of our Savior, God and man. He's our great God. He's our merciful Savior. We are waiting for complete liberation from our sin when we will see him as just as he is. His second coming guarantees our salvation, our final salvation, not judgment, salvation. Is it not a great encouragement for us? The second reason for our godly life is found in the grace of his first coming. In the grace of the first coming of Christ, Paul reminded us of Christ's first appearance in verse 11. And he returns to it again in verse 14. Let's read together. Uh, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Dear friends, we enjoy freedom from our ungodliness, from worldly desires in our present lives. And we are eager for our complete, complete cleansing from any sin in future. And both are secured by Jesus' death on the cross. He is the one who gave himself for us. This is grace. This is grace indeed. Dear friends, our Lord did not leave us without hope. When we fix our eyes upon Jesus, we see him everywhere, both in, in the past and in our future. His first coming brought us God's grace. His second coming guarantees his glory. Let us not forget that Paul associated true blessedness with hope, with our trust in the Lord. Let us not be deceived. There is no other fount. There is no other source of blessedness. As Jesus warns, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Let us not stare at our feet. Sometimes we think that we, we have to have the, our best life now and here. We deceive ourselves that we can take care for our present life 
in the best way. But think about it, by staring down, by staring down, we lose our goal, the blessed hope. That's why we are overburdened, we are crawling, we are depressed, we are crazy busy, we have dead sometimes. We need clear vision of Christ's glory ahead of us. Clear vision. We need to recognize God's good purpose for us. Perhaps some of you still remember the old Russian proverb. There is nothing worse than to wait and to chase somebody. There's nothing worse to wait and to chase somebody. Notice how different Christians are. How different. Because our greatest joy is to wait. To wait for Christ's return. And our greatest goal is to chase or to pursue Christ's glory in our life. We are not discouraged because love of Christ controls us. Friends, gospel, the gospel instructs us not to stare at our feet, but to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Thus, Jesus Christ is the center of life for every genuine Christian. He himself help us, helps us to confirm the saving character of God's grace. He teaches us to pay attention to the following three instructions. Don't look back. Don't live like others live. And don't stare at your feet. Actually, these instructions encompass all, our whole life. They remind us to fix our eyes upon Jesus who once came and is coming. And he is coming. We are learning to trust in him. We are learning that his grace is sufficient for us. We can really be blessed by him, happy in him. All other founts, oh yeah, they just promise us peace, joy, happiness, but in reality, they deceive us. They are like a mirage that disappears when you approach, come closer. The world and its desires are never able to satisfy our soul. They are never able to relieve the pressure of our guilt before God. Only Christ, only Christ is able. Only his death on the cross secures our forgiveness and freedom as we put our trust in him. And in him alone, not in our merits, as it's written in Titus 3, verse 4. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's stand up together and pray to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our dear Lord, we are thankful for Jesus Christ who came to die on the cross for our transgressions, for our sins. And we're so thankful that our salvation is secure. We're so thankful that our sins are forgiven. We're so thankful that we're liberated for, from guilt. We're so thankful that everything in our life is meaningful. And we're also thankful for all your promises about Christ's return. We, we are waiting for him. We know that with his coming, we'll enjoy the complete freedom and liberation from our sin. And we're eager to see that time. We're eager to rest upon his chest. And we ask you, please, help us to live our present lives in such a way that everybody around us will see, will see how how the gospel of Jesus Christ is effective, how strong it is, how much difference it makes in our lives. 
And we're very thankful for Jesus Christ. We praise your name. We really want to sing your praises. Amen. Thank you, Alexander, for ministering your, uh, the message of, of God's Word to us and encouraging us with that. Um, let us be dismissed from Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Have a blessed week. Mothers, happy Mother's Day.